the regional banks are getting crushed. In fact, New York Community Bank down almost 35% in one day. So we've got to ask the question, has the next phase of the banking crisis just started? I'm going to answer that for you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over the stuff, and yes, that is a technical term, <laughs> hitting the fan. In fact, let's cut to an expert on CNBC that is putting it in terms that are a little bit more industry specific, we'll say. Yeah, digging in, uh, it's, it's a mess. It's a real mess. So now let's go over some specifics as to why this is a big mess. <laughs> he might actually be understating it. Okay, we start the chart going back to 2004 all the way to today's date. On the left, we go from zero up to $180 billion. A lot of you will recognize this chart. It is the BTFP Bank Term Funding Program. This is basically the tool that the Fed created back in March of 2023 to bail out the system after Silicon Valley Bank, Signature, and First Republic went bust. And we can see how the utilization went parabolic, straight up to 60, 65 billion, as you would imagine, when we were going through the first phase of the banking crisis. And then it kind of leveled off, but then it kept going up and up and up and up till we get to about November of 2023. Now, what's interesting about November of 2023 is the interest rate that the Fed was charging went down to, let's say, around 4.8%. But the interest rate the Fed was paying on bank reserves was around 5.25%. So this huge spike that you see, just going parabolic all the way up to where it is today, let's call it 165 billion. The market, or the talking heads at CNBC or FinTwit, they were all saying that this was exclusively a result of an arbitrage play. So what these banksters could do is they could borrow from the BTFP at let's say 4.8%, and then they could just park those reserves at the Fed and collect 5.25%. But this leads us to another question. Is this entire parabolic move completely a result of this arbitrage play? Or is this also a result of these cracks in the system that we're seeing play out right now, once again, with these regional banks and their share price. So let's go back to when the BTFP was set up. And like I said, it went up to about $65 billion. But then it kept going higher and higher and higher until we get to that point in November when there was an actual arbitrage opportunity. You see what I'm saying? Let me highlight again to make sure that we're all on the same page. That arbitrage opportunity was created in November. But yet, from March or April until November, there was no arbitrage opportunity. And yet, the BTFP increased by pretty much the exact same amount as it's gone up more recently. So I don't think that we can contribute this entire move to arbitrage. In fact, I would say the probabilities are highest that this move higher, even going back to March, April of 2023, was a result of further strain within the regional banks. Oh, but wait, there is more. Most of you know that the BTFP was set up as a bailout, as we talked about earlier, but we also have to remember that this is different than the Fed being the lender of last resort in something like the discount window, as an example. Why is it different? Well, first and foremost, they're getting 100 cents on the dollar. So if they buy a treasury for $1, even if the value of the treasury goes down to 10 cents, the Fed at the BTFP will still give them $1. Where at the discount window, they'll only give them the 10 cents, the market value for that specific asset. But the elephant in the room here is this program expires March 11th. Now, you may be saying to yourself, okay, George, well, you've talked about this before, and of course the Fed is just going to renew the program. Not so fast. They came out with a statement the other day where Jerome Powell said specifically they are not renewing the program. And it is definitely going to expire March 11th. So let's just assume for a moment that the majority of this move higher more recently is a result 
of more strains, stresses, and cracks in the regional banking system, and therefore, because of the systemic risk, the overall banking system at large. All right, well, what happens if you take away the security blanket? Well, then the whole house of cards comes crashing down. And that's not all. The Fed just met the other day and kept rates at the same level, 5.25%. But they came out with a statement. And what's interesting is one of the main revisions to that statement, where they took out the U.S. banking system is sound and resilient. Step number two, to determine whether or not we've gone into the next phase of the banking crisis in 2024, we've actually got to go back in time. In fact, we've got to go all the way back to the 1600s. That's right. So let's remember how this crazy banking system that we have today actually started. Well, we'll say this is Bank A and Bank B. Back then it was probably blacksmiths or something like that. But they had a balance sheet, just like the banks have today. And back in those days, there were average Joes. Now, I don't know if there were Moody the Millennials. <laughs> oh, and their blue hair back in the 1600s. But we'll assume that there were, <laughs> or that there was. Okay, so the average Joe starts with this gold coin, gold bar. It's like, you know what, this thing's kind of cumbersome. It's a great asset. I love it. It's definitely money. I've watched all of Mike Maloney's YouTube videos, and I, I, I want to keep this gold coin. <laughs> but I want to take this gold coin and put it somewhere safe, where I don't have to worry about it getting stolen or something like that. So I'm going to go down to the local blacksmith, and again, we'll just call this bank A, and I'm going to deposit my gold coin with them. Now, what are they going to do? They're going to give me a receipt, uh, maybe a piece of paper, whatever it was, that says, Joe, we owe you one gold coin. Joe says, okay, cool. Now, all the people in the town know this blacksmith, and they realize, and they've been in business, let's say, for 25 years, and they've never had a problem. Every single time that they have taken this IOU and given it to this blacksmith, they have received their gold coin, regardless of who is holding that piece of paper. So they have a fantastic reputation. And ditto that for the blacksmith call it Bank B, in the next town where Moody the Millennial lives. They've been doing the same thing for the exact time frame, we'll say, 25 years. they got a great reputation. So let's go back to Joe receiving his IOU. Moody is producing some stuff, maybe some leather or honey or... <laughs> Whatever it is you'd buy back in the 1600s, let's say Moody is making that. And Joe wants some of Moody's honey. Oh, yes. So he says, Moody, I will give you this IOU for a gold coin from Blacksmith Air Bank A if you give me some of your delicious honey. And Moody says, yeah, okay. Well, I actually know these guys pretty well and I understand their reputation. So yeah, I'll go ahead and accept that IOU. You don't have to go down there and get the actual gold coin. So we have a transaction where the stuff goes from Moody over to the Joe, and Joe gives them, because I'm sure pronouns were very important back in the 1600s, just like they are today in 2024. So we, we want to get that right. So Joe gives them this receipt from that guy or that entity. Now, the problem that Moody has is they want to go ahead and spend this IOU because they want to buy some more goods and services that can help them create more honey in the future. They want to go buy some more bees. But the local beekeeper doesn't know Blacksmith A, so he won't take that IOU. So Moody goes to the local guy and says, hey, can you go ahead and take these 
IOUs and give me some of yours because the beekeeper in this town trusts you, but they don't know this guy. So Bank B said, you know, I know this guy really, really well. I've been doing business with him for 25 years. Of course, I'll go ahead and take those. And then Moody, I'll give you some of my IOUs. So everybody is all square. Everybody's set. Everybody's good to go. But let's look at the balance sheets here. So we've still got that gold coin, which is actually now an asset of this entity. And the liability are the IOUs, the receipts, pieces of paper that Joe used to buy Moody's honey. Well, those receipts are now an asset of B entity and the liability are the IOUs that they just created. Okay, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. But at some point in time, they're gonna to have to settle up. So what then happens is, we'll call it Bank A, and I keep going back and forth between Bank and Blacksmith, but you guys get it, you guys get it. So Entity A <laughs> takes the gold coin, sends it over to Entity B, and Entity B sends these IOUs back over to Entity A. And therefore, since it's IOU, it just nets out. So now the balance sheet is back to zero, pretty much right here, because that would net out as well. And then we have that IOU, but this nets out because you've got the offsetting asset is now in your possession. So this is how really the banking system started. Now, I don't know if it was the 1600s. Uh, we'll be referencing a paper from the Bank of England that goes back to that time frame. But whenever it started, this is how it played out. Now, I know a lot of you right now are looking at this and saying, George, uh, okay, I, I get it. Thanks for the history lesson. But what on earth does this have to do with the banking system today? And more specifically, what does this have to do with the potential banking crisis or the next phase of the banking crisis that we could be moving into? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's look at how the modern day banking system works. So Joe is there and he's got his dollars, electronic digits, basically, we call them commercial bank liabilities, from Bank of America, but he's fed up with Bank of America. He wants to go to Wells Fargo or Bank A. So he just takes his electronic digits, we'll call them dollars, which are basically IOUs, and deposits them with this bank. So that bank takes his account balance from zero up to, let's just say, $100. So that is a liability of this bank. Okay, well, the original bank, called Bank of America, has to offset that liability with an asset. So let's just say they transfer over some bank reserves. Those are liabilities of the Federal Reserve. Okay, so Joe now has these electronic digits in his account here, but he wants to buy some honey, <laughs> once again, from Moody the Millennial, or maybe their distant relatives. Maybe these were their great, 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 great grandparents or something like that. But anyway, the next generation of Joes and Moody's, or this generation of Joes and Moody's, wants to do the same transaction. So Joe takes those IOUs, gives them to Moody. Now what happens is these electronic digits or liabilities go over to Bank B. And then Bank B gives them to Moody. In other words, they take their account from zero, let's say up to the $100. So now Moody can take those $100 and trade them for other goods and services, maybe going over to that generation of the beekeeper. So now let's go ahead and look at the balance sheets that are involved. We've got the bank reserves as the assets. We've got the IOUs, but now instead of this bank owing Joe the $100, they owe Bank B. And of course, Bank B gave those IOUs to Moody. But you see what has happened here, because they haven't technically settled yet. But Bank B has extended Bank A the credit. Now let's compare these balance sheets to these balance sheets. You notice anything different? No. Other than we've replaced gold with a bank reserve, but you have an asset there to begin with. Other than that, this transaction is absolutely 
identical. There is no difference whatsoever between what banks were doing in the 1600s and what banks are doing today. But let's take it a step further. How would the banks determine actually when to settle? They wouldn't do it daily. That would be way too cumbersome. Would they do it weekly? Would they do it monthly? Well, if we actually look at what the Bank of England told us in this 2011 report that I referenced earlier, it was basically a result of how much these banks trusted each other. What was their reputation? So again, let's think back to this example. And with Bank A, they've been in business for 25 years. This guy's been in business 25 years. They know each other very, very well. The towns are separate, but they're only like five miles apart. This guy's kids go to school with this kid's, and this guy's grandparents know this guy's grandparents. They've known each other for generations. So since there's a cost to settlement, keep in mind, to take this gold coin from here to here, we've got to hire some guy on the Pony Express, and he's got to have security and all these things. There's a cost to that, and there's a risk. So what if the risk of transporting this gold coin is higher than the risk of this entity just keeping the IOUs from his buddy? You see where I'm going with this. If the counterparty risk is extremely low or the perceived counterparty risk, what ends up happening are these IOUs are effectively the exact same thing as that gold coin. You say, George, that's impossible. There's, there's no way that uh, an IOU could ever be as good as a gold coin. Oh, really? What do you trade on a daily basis? Did you go down to Starbucks and buy a coffee today? Did Starbucks take gold coins? Or did they take your electronic IOUs from your commercial bank? Let's look at it another way. What are the probabilities right now that you would assess JP Morgan going out of business? and them not only going out of business, but then the Fed not stepping into the government and bailing them out. Almost zero. So if Bank A has an IOU from JP Morgan, do you think that they really, really need to settle in bank reserves? No, of course not. They'll just go ahead and take those IOUs and trade them as an asset to another bank. Let's walk through how this would work. So now we've got bank A, B, and C added another bank here. And we start with the exact same as we kind of finished up here. Okay, but let's assume for a moment that bank B decided that they wanted to create a loan. All right, this guy wants a mortgage. Seems like he's going to pay us back with interest. This makes sense. So now all of a sudden they've got a loan asset on their balance sheet, but they've created more of these basically pieces of paper that says IOU, which is just a number in your bank account. Nowadays, it's the exact same thing. So then what happens is the customer says, okay, I want to buy this house, but the seller banks with bank C. So what ends up happening is bank B sends the IOUs down to bank C. So now they're a deposit liability on their balance sheet, but they have to send also an offsetting asset. Well, they could go ahead and send bank reserves, but everyone knows that these IOUs, let's say they're from JP Morgan, are as good as gold. But JP Morgan ain't going out of business. So what happens is Bank C says, yeah, I'll go ahead and take these IOUs from JP Morgan. I don't really need the bank reserves because this transaction is easier and we don't have to settle on the Fed's balance sheet. So when the transaction is said and done, those bank reserves haven't left the balance sheet of let's say JP Morgan, we've got these electronic digits, IOUs that are the exact same. Now we've got this loan, and then we had the original deposit. And then over here with Bank C, they've got this new deposit liability. And then they have this asset, which of course is a liability of the original bank. But now let's take it one step further. Let's assume for a moment that there are no bank reserves. In fact, what are bank reserves? It's simply an IOU from a bank called the Federal Reserve. So let's just assume for a moment, no bank reserves. Could these transactions have taken place with a different IOU 
let's just say from bank D. If this would have been, and this is going to be tough to draw here, guys. I'm just going to put an I here to make it easy. <laughs> there we go. So if that would have been an IOU from bank D, would it have been any different than an IOU from the central bank? The answer is obviously no. So where I'm going with this is the entire banking system, the way it's set up today, is built on confidence and risk. That's it. Step number three. Now let's go ahead and answer the question, have we moved into the next phase of the banking crisis? Based on what we discussed in step number two, you realize that this is all just simply about risk and confidence. So to answer the main question, it's actually very simple. We just have to ask ourselves, do we think that risk is going to go up and therefore confidence down in the future? Or do we think that risk within the banking system is going to go back down to where it was prior to March of 2023? Well, let's go right back to CNBC and the experts and hear what they have to say. In 2008, the banks we focused on on the short side were banks that aggressively grew their <clears> lending <throat> book, particularly in the residential and construction areas. And, uh, you know, those were really the hallmarks of the banks that ran into the biggest issues. And I think when you look at banks that have really aggressively loaned, grown their commercial lending books this cycle, and NYCB is a great example of that. They bought a you know, significant mortgage, mortgage originator at the top, and they bought uh, a lot of rent-controlled loans from Signature here. Um, you know, they are banks that you know, are going to face issues. So what he's highlighting is back in 2008, sounds like he shorted the banks back then and made a, a killing. He was saying the reason he shorted them is because he saw the risk increasing because they had all of this exposure to the housing market. And this go around, he sees the exact same thing happening with the regional banks, not because they have exposure to residential real estate, but because they have this exposure to commercial real estate. So the main takeaway is if you believe this problem in commercial real estate that the banks are exposed to is going to play out very similar to the problem in residential real estate during the GFC. And then if you also believe in the yield curve, which basically has preceded every single recession that we've had going back to 1950, we can see how this plays out. You've got like a perfect storm where commercial real estate is tanking, and obviously that's increasing the risk in the banking system, lowering confidence, while at the same time we could be going into a hard landing or a recession, which would make the unemployment rate go even higher, which would also make the occupancy rate for commercial real estate to go lower. In fact, much, much lower, which would make the commercial real estate crisis even worse. And at the end of the day, that makes risk within the banking system skyrocket. There are no certainties. There are only probabilities. So I can't say definitively that the next phase of this banking crisis has started. But what I can say with a high degree of confidence is the banking crisis is far from over. So I know a lot of you right about now are probably asking yourself the question, well, George, how do I protect myself? I understand what you're saying. I definitely believe that the banking crisis is far from over, we'll likely have a hard landing in 2024, 2025. We're headed for some very volatile times, to say the least. But what do I do? Do I buy gold? Do I buy bonds, dollars, stocks? I mean, who knows? Well, I'd like to suggest checking out one of my websites, Rebel Capitals Live. This is the annual conference that I have in Orlando. It's May 31st this year, where I bring in the experts. You can meet them, ask them questions face to face. You can hear their presentations. And what this does is it helps educate you. And as you guys know from watching my good buddy Robert Kiyosaki over all these years, this is the key to pretty much everything. You're only as good as the people you surround yourself by. So if you want to survive and thrive, whatever is coming in 2024, you're probably not going to do it if you're just hanging around with all of your buddies watching Monday Night Football. <laughs> Unless you got some really smart buddies. So you've got to get to a place 
where you can hang out, where you can interact with people like Mike Green, like Jeff Snyder, like Ken McElroy, or Mark Moss, just to name a few. Then once you start educating yourself, you can understand the process that you need to take, the way you should set up your portfolio to achieve your objectives. And this gives you a huge edge, which at the end of the day is what it's all about if you want to not only survive, but build wealth and thrive regardless of what this crazy economy, the crazy government, and the crazy banking system throws our way in the next couple years. So check out rebelcapitalslive.com, get your tickets, and I will see you on the next video and in Orlando, May 31st.